Hello friends, Patrick here again. This is my last video before the big move. I saw a posting from a friend yesterday about a best-selling book. How the Prime Minister Stole Freedom. I calculated how much that book is probably making. That book is probably making anywhere between 50 and 100 sales per day. It's probably making ballpark around $500 per day. Now that number will, will gradually decrease over time, of course, as sales of books go. But let's say even conservative, $400 a day, I would say minimum. $2,000 a week, something like that, eight to $10,000 a month that book is making. That single book, that book is 35 pages long. That book is self-published. If that person was a established children's book author and went through a book publishing company, that publishing company would take the bulk of the profits. It wouldn't pay that author for three to six months until after the sales. When you self-publish with Amazon, they pay you every month. I mean, there, there is a, there's a lag of, of 30 to 60 days. I forget what it is. I think it's a 60-day lag. But you get paid every month in sequence. Book publishers will give you a, a, a royalty payment six months or a year after your book gets published. And then they'll pay you sometimes quarterly, sometimes twice a year. So the whole old-fashioned system of... of Publishing books the old-fashioned way has gone the way of the dodo. And this gentleman that published this book, Derek Smith, his name is, I believe, it could be a pseudonym. Um, pseudonyms are great because you can keep your privacy. Somebody said, you don't have 200 books on Amazon. I, I looked, you, you don't, you know how to. I do have I, have, I have over 100 books on Amazon. They're not under my name. I only have, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 under my own name. But I have tons of books and they're easy to do. Just go into Google Anal Analytics and, and look for what people are looking for. How to and fill in the blank. You can put in whatever you're good at, whatever you're interested in, how to this. You make a, a book. It can be 20 pages, 50 pages, 100 pages. It could take you uh, a week, a month to produce. You can make, I've made some in a weekend. I've made some in a weekend. Now, they don't sell a lot, but when you build momentum and you have a lot of titles out there that are active titles, like I said, I, I put together about 200 mini books and only about 100 of them were actually able to sell even, even a small amount and even a smaller fraction of that were able to sell consistently. But those ones that sell consistently can make you a residual income. Now, this gentleman, Derek Smith, he made some other titles and he tried, you can see that he's got some other, he doesn't even have an author page up yet, um, but he's made some other titles and, and um, but boom, he hit a home run. He hit a home run with this book. That book will pay him, um, it will pay him for the next, you know, year, two years, that could be selling for five years. Imagine the difference that that income makes to prosperity. And I bet if you were to ask that person, what was his mindset going into producing that? How come anybody can't just do that? How come I can't just do the same thing and do it? Well, you can, but he had to have faith and an idea that that fit that perfect timing where you knock it out of the park. Now it doesn't help, doesn't doesn't hurt that um, the CBC put out a news article denigrating. Justin Trudeau saying, oh, his days are numbered. Even the top selling book on Amazon is a book about, a, a kid's book about how he stole the freedom, right? Talk about great exposure when the mainstream media is promoting your book for you. Kaboom, kaboom. But those type of things are possible to anybody in today's digital metaspace, uh, cyberspace that we live in, right? You can provide digital products deliver them digitally, you can work from home, you can make residual income 
that's different from the traditional ways. The traditional ways are still great, of course. If you have skill, if you know how to do HVAC, if you know how to do plumbing, if you know how to do to wire a house electrically, you make a ton of money that way too. But these are the areas that are innovative and bring great rewards for people that have faith. Now, it's funny that CBC put that in their article when they were bashing Trudeau. Doesn't it seem, it gives me a great segue to talk about politics, doesn't it seem like all of a sudden the mainstream media, both CBC, CTV, had news reports saying, oh, Trudeau, and the National Post had news reports come out and say, oh, Trudeau's days are numbered now. His days are numbered now. So, hi, Snake. It's okay. I'm just making a quick video here. Um, the, um, uh, the MSM has turned on Justin Trudeau. They've abandoned him all of a sudden. And that's a good sign for us that want to have better leadership for our country. That's a good sign for the bulk of Canadians that are fed up with him from multi-political backgrounds that are saying, this guy is, you know, he's arrogant, he's pompous, he doesn't listen to what the people are asking for. And look how much pressure was put on. This is why we got to keep faith to keep that pressure on our political leaders by speaking up, by peacefully expressing our opinions without too much hatred. I mean, you can use, you know, sarcasm and this and that and, and all that kind of stuff. Nobody wants to be overly hateful. Uh, Justin Trudeau is so paranoid, he wants to introduce legislation to, to control what you can say through the CRTC um, uh, on the internet and, and what have you. So he's trying to restrict free speech, a typical of a tyrant. Um, but this pressure that kept pushing and pushing and pushing, say, hey, when are you going to lift the mandates? Half, half the world has already lifted their mandates. And even up until that moment, they were uh, pushing Omar uh, Alagabra, uh, the uh, Minister of Transport, to say, hey, what's going on? And you can see they finally crumble. They said, hey, look, at the people are, are going nuts. They keep asking for this. we got to do something. Somebody somewhere had to buckle in and say, okay, we, you know, this is, this is ridiculous what we're doing. And we, we have to keep that pressure up politically to push for what is right and what is true and what helps us as a community, as a national community, as a provincial community, as a local community. We have to push for what is right and fair for uh, a democratic uh, civilization where the majority of people decide how to how to implement the law of the land it's not just rule by tyranny it's not just rule by the elites no we live in a democratic society where you have the majority of people submit their vote submit their opinion and say we think this this is what's fair people should have their jobs and not be discriminated against because of the medical choices they make and if you keep pushing for the truth the truth will prevail so i wanted to talk about that one last thing i was sitting on the porch yesterday chatting with a good friend and I was watching a spider build his web and I was thinking to myself, you know, how would Richard Dawkins explain that a spider is able to build that web? That web was so, the, 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 the spider was as tiny as, as you could barely see it and it covered a distance of this big, the web, and it was invisible, completely invisible. Even if I looked in the sunlight as the sun was setting, I could just barely see the rainbow colors it was making in that beautiful pattern. But it was the, 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 the microns thick that even up close, I couldn't see it. Totally invisible web. It was amazing. And the only way that Dawkins can explain something like that, being the Darwinist that he is, is it has to be through Darwinian principles. It has to be through natural selection over eons of time. So there must have been a beetle at one time and it was able to, this, this different beetle uh, was, was born and it, and it had a slightly different genetic makeup and so it was able to produce some web and then it was able to catch a bug with it and then it, its ability kept increasing, increasing and eventually it was able to build a web. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. For the, the whole substance of Dawkins, Dawkins' explanation for the creation of life is that a molecule just randomly got created from chemical interactions in the primordial soup when the earth was forming, maybe from lightning or from these base chemicals, and then a molecule spontaneously formed. And then that molecule joined with other molecules and eventually a cell formed just magically, but not just any cell, a cell that was able to self-replicate. 
So that first cell was able to divide in two and then keep dividing and keep dividing and keep dividing. And then those cells became more and more complex and then they turned into slime and then they turned into amoebas or they turned into tiny microorganisms. And then those tiny microorganisms kept, kept growing and growing. And then eventually they turned into a reptile and then a reptile turned into a chimpanzee and then a chimpanzee turned into a human over time. Absolutely ridiculous. Now he has an out as well, I should mention. He has an out. He says, well, maybe the first life, uh, um, even though it just had to happen that way, maybe the first life was created by an intelligent uh, civilization outside of our solar system from another, you know, from aliens, essentially. But he doesn't explain where the aliens came from. So you, you're, you have a circular argument so that he can escape if somebody pushes him too hard on the idea that life just emerged from nothing. A second thing I want to leave you with before I go today, I'm going to shorten this video, is that every year we have milkweed that grows up. It's a plant that the monarch butterfly loves. And every year the caterpillars appear on the milkweed. We don't, you don't know where they come from. Maybe they're buried in the ground over the winter. They just appear, just like 10 caterpillars appear every year. Well, these particular caterpillars they appear every year and they munch on the leaves and have a grand old time. And after a short while, they go underneath one of the leaves. They build themselves a cocoon that turns into a chrysalis and they entomb themselves into that little pod. And then lo and behold, after a short period of time, what happens? A butterfly comes out. The whole concept of Darwinian evolution the whole concept requires gazillions of years. I mean, I'm exaggerating. Millions and billions, whatever it is, to get from simple life forms to complex life form, to explain the transitions between animals and uh, different species of animals and so on and so forth. They need that time frame because they say, oh, it takes so much time for these minor changes to, to, to keep going and then the next generation and it helps the next generation uh, uh, survive better than this other generation generation of species and on and on. You know, you've heard the arguments, right? You've got a caterpillar that turns into a completely different life form. It turns into a flying butterfly. Let's forget about the fact that all the monarchs end up going down to the same place for a big convention in Central America. All the, all, they all go to the same place for some reason. It's, it's a very unique creature. Totally unexplainable by Darwinian principles. Absolutely unexplainable that you can have one life form transform into another life form in a matter of weeks, not a million zillion years. I want to leave that with you. Just think about it for a while. For those people that are so committed to evolution, oh, evolution is true. And the funny thing is, is that if, if you're in academia and you don't accept Darwinian evolution whole hog, you're basically ostracized. You're basically made a laughing stock, right? You have to accept that. That's one of the pillars of being involved in any field of science. So that's how far we've come, is that we accept that without question. Scientists have to accept it. And what goes along with it is atheism, because that is what gives the atheist their foundation. Their foundation is that life appeared just randomly. It just had to happen because we're here. We're proof that life just spontaneously was created. But it's an absolutely ridiculous concept. And at the crux of atheism is the idea. There's an interesting passage in Isaiah that explains the a motivation of Lucifer. It, it gives a, a description of his thought process. And what is that thought process? It says, I will be like God. You see what that is? <clears throat> the atheist says, I don't need God because I don't want to be responsible to something outside of myself. It's like the person that doesn't want to be responsible or obedient to their earthly parents. No wonder Christ said, you're of your father, the devil. And other people that he saw and he said to them, hey, you come follow me. You're of your father, the heavenly father, you're, you're, 
you have the same father that I do. Remember when he rose from the dead, he said, I'm going back to my father and your father. That what a comforting statement that he made. He explained to people that we have a heavenly father, right? He didn't say, oh, you have to follow this and you got to build this religion and you got to do all this stuff. No, he simply explained to them, look it, I'm going back to my father. You have a heavenly father. Follow him, right? Follow him the way that I did. But who did he say the other comments to? The priests, the politicians, the people that like to wear the fancy robes and all that kind of stuff. He said, you're of your father, the devil. And that's what atheism does. It says, I'll be like God. You know, I'll elevate myself. You can read that passage in, in Isaiah where it describes the thought process of Lucifer, apparently a, one of the fallen angels. I don't know all the, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a theologian, but some people have all their theories about where Lucifer came from. Maybe he was a fallen angel. I don't know. doesn't matter. That thought process that says, I don't have to be responsible to a heavenly creator. I can create my own morality. I can be my own God. I can love myself beyond anything else. You know, Whitney Houston saying the greatest love of all is loving yourself. Well, yeah, it's important to love yourself, but I mean, come on, you know, the idea that we were created by God who is infinitely powerful, infinitely intelligent, beyond what we could imagine. He's so far beyond it says that his thoughts are way, way beyond what we can Im imagine, right? And that's what makes sense for creation. When you see these magnificent creatures like a spider building a web or a caterpillar that can turn into a butterfly, just like that. It's, it's beyond Darwin, way beyond Darwin. You know, Darwin doesn't explain. And the guy went on a boat trip and he, ex he explained what he... What he saw and talked about, and a lot of stuff he saw, I said, I can't explain this through my, my own theories. He admitted it. He didn't become all religious on his deathbed or any of these myth, myth that's made up about him. But, I mean, he acknowledged God all the time. You can see that in his writings. Anyway, um, I'll leave that thought with you because that is a very deceptive thing that is trying to pervade the world right now. And it's trying to take over the thoughts and hearts of people to say, there's no God, you know, you just have to be responsible to yourself. You just have to be a good person and create your own morality. Well, good luck with that, because it's not hard to see where that ends up. It's not hard to see where it ends up when you cast off theism and you say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my own God. It doesn't work. It, I'm telling you, it doesn't work. So I'll leave that with you. Prosperity, politics, and evolution. I hope you have a fantastic day. I love you very much. I won't see you for a little while because tomorrow's ground zero. Tomorrow's moving day. And so I'm going to be offline for a short period of time. But I'll be back soon. And um, I hope to be able to talk to you soon. I hope you have a fantastic long weekend or weekend that's coming up. It feels like a long weekend is coming up, but that's okay. Have yourself a great weekend. And I'll talk to you probably early next week or as soon as I can. And we'll find some other exciting things to talk about. We're living in exciting times. And um, I hope you prosper in all things. Take care of yourself. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you soon. Take care.